My name is Daniel. I'm standing in the attic of my newly purchased Victorian home, staring at a fresh hole in one of the walls. It was my first attempt at demolishing a wall, hoping to turn this place into an open space loft. The dust from the collapsed wall fills the air, floating like mist in the harsh glow of my work lamp. But that's not what grabs my attention. It's the void that the collapse revealed, a hidden compartment nestled within the house's old wooden structure. The excitement, the curiosity, the adrenaline, they all mix together as I step toward it. Reaching in by hands brushing against something unexpectedly soft. I pull out a stack of old journals, their leather bindings worn and faded. My heart pounds in my chest. This feels like one of those surreal moments when reality shifts into the pages of a mystery novel. Danny, my wife Kate, calls from downstairs. Her voice startles me, and the journals nearly tumble out of my hands. Are you okay? What was that noise? Yeah, I'm fine. I call back, my eyes never leaving the aged journals. Just found something. Interesting. Hearing the intrigue in my voice, she ascends the stairs. What is it? She asks, her breath hitching as she sees the old journals in my hand. I'm not sure, let's find out, I reply, opening the first journal. The brittle pages crackle under my touch as I have opened it. The first page of the journal, penned in an elegant but firm handwriting, reads as follows. March 3rd, 1980. My name is Dr. Rupert Price. For record-keeping purposes and perhaps as a testament to my sanity, I've decided to maintain this journal. Today, I begin my work on what is formally classified as Project Broken Minds. The name is ominous, perhaps deliberately so, meant to keep us ever cognizant of the gravity of our undertaking. I am a scientist employed by the government and I'm tasked with exploring the unknown territories of the human mind. Specifically, my colleagues and I have been charged with investigating the possibilities of manipulating human memories and emotions. It sounds like a plot from a dystopian novel. I know, but the reality is that we live in a world where the balance of power is delicate, and information is the most potent weapon. The work is confidential, buried so deep within the government's infrastructure that it doesn't officially exist. We operate from a hidden lab, filled with cutting-edge equipment and imbued with an atmosphere of secrecy and urgency. Our team is composed of the most brilliant minds in the fields of neuroscience and psychology, and picked from all over the country. While I harbor no illusions about the moral complexities of our mission, I remain committed to the pursuit of knowledge, to unraveling the mysteries of our consciousness. It is a frightening, awe-inspiring prospect, the power to shape the very fabric of someone's perception, to edit the raw material of who they are. Only time will reveal the fruits of our labor, whether they be the sweet taste of success or the bitter regret of a mission gone wrong. With this entry, I mark the first step on our journey, a path that leads us into uncharted territory. Project Broken Minds. Kate echoes the disbelief evident in her voice. A shrug, equally bewildered. The house did belong to an old government official. I say, remembering the realtor's information. Maybe there's some truth to it. The silence settles between us, punctuated only by the soft rustle of the turning pages. The intrigue is magnetic, and I find myself pulled deeper into Dr. Price's mysterious past. We should look into this, Kate. I say, my eyes still fixated on the cryptic words of Dr. Price. She looks at me, her eyes reflecting the same excitement and curiosity mirrored in mine. Okay, Daniel, she replies with a determined nod. The second journal entry, written in the same precise handwriting as the first, reads, March 10th, 1980. A week into Project Broken Minds, and I already sensed the formidable nature of our task. Today, we initiated the first round of experiments on voluntary subjects. These individuals, all consenting adults, are driven by an admirable mix of patriotism and curiosity, though I fear they may not fully understand the extent of our research. Our work is invasive, probing the intimate depths of their memories and emotions. The aim is to create malleable minds that can be manipulated, reconstructed, and erased. The potential applications for espionage are clear, yet so is the ethical precipice upon which we stand. Today's subject, a middle-aged man known to us only as Subject One, underwent the preliminary procedure. We applied a series of neural stimulations combined with experimental drugs designed to facilitate memory fragmentation and reformation. The process was taxing, both physically and psychologically. Subject one emerged disoriented and confused. His distress was observable as we began to test the results, 
probing the validity of a fabricated memory we implanted during the procedure. A false recollection of a summer spent in Paris, a city he had never visited. To our astonishment, he recalled this false memory in vivid detail, speaking of the phantom smell of fresh croissants and the sound of laughter echoing along the scene. The success was thrilling, but it came at a cost. Seeing the bewilderment in his eyes as he grappled with a reality that did not exist was chilling. Despite the apparent success, I find myself wrestling with the implications. What we are doing here it has the potential to change the world, but at what cost? This question echoes in my mind as I end this entry. I'm hunched over in the dim light of my attic, my gaze locked onto the faded ink of the journal's latest entry. The manipulation of human memories and emotions, I murmur aloud, the words twisting uncomfortably in my mouth. It's a terrifying concept, the idea of someone meddling in the most sacred corners of your mind, your memories, and emotions just for espionage. Kate sits across from me, her expression mirroring my unease. Daniel, she begins, her voice barely a whisper. How could they even do that? I shake my head, a cold shiver crawling down my spine. Dr. Press's words and his meticulous, emotionless detailing of the procedures are unnerving. The following journal entry continues in the same methodical clinical tone. March 24th, 1980. Two weeks have passed since our first experiment, and Subject 1 has been readjusting remarkably well. His acceptance of the fabricated memory suggests that we are on the path to achieving our objective. However, the ethical quandaries continue to mount. Today, we attempted our second experiment with a new subject, Subject 2. The aim was to not only implant a new memory, but to erase an existing one. Subject two, a young woman with a fear of heights, was our ideal candidate. We aimed to eliminate this fear, replacing it with a fabricated memory of joyful childhood experiences of climbing trees and exploring rooftops. Our team administered the experimental drugs and began the neural stimulation process. The procedure lasted for several hours, with the subject experiencing distress and confusion during the memory transition phase. Post-procedure, she emerged with no recollection of her fear, instead recounting with enthusiasm the newly implanted memories of climbing high into treetops and looking down with exhilaration, not fear. While the success of the procedure was a cause for scientific celebration, it was tempered by the eerie sight of a person's past rewritten so completely. It was a testament to the power we were beginning to wield and a reminder of the potential for misuse. The project was achieving its objectives, yet each success seemed to further erode the ethical bedrock upon which we initially justify our actions. This is uncharted territory, with both the potential for unprecedented advancements and terrifying pitfalls. As the boundary between reality and fabrication blurs for our subjects, it becomes crucial for us, the architects of this project, to remember the difference. The next entry in the journal is a significant departure from the earlier clinical tone. Here, Dr. Price's doubts and fears become increasingly apparent. April 15th, 1980. A month into Project Broken Minds, and the name has taken on a chillingly literal interpretation. We're breaking minds, tearing into the fabric of individual realities, and replacing them with crafted illusions. The potential for misuse has transformed from a distant concern into a present danger. Today, we experimented on Subject 3. The aim was to implant a full set of false memories, creating an alternate identity. The subject, a willing participant, was to become, for all intents and purposes, a different person with a fabricated past. We chose a man in his thirties, unattached and seemingly unfazed by the drastic change he was about to undergo. The procedure was grueling, extending over twelve hours, with careful monitoring and adjustment our protocols. Emerging from the process, he was disoriented but responsive. He identified himself by the new name we had given him were telling detailed stories of a childhood and adolescence he had never experienced. He laughed at shared memories with imaginary friends, his eyes welling up with non-existent nostalgia. For a moment, we celebrated. The procedure was a success, but the elation was short-lived, replaced by a hollow dread. We had stolen a man's identity and replaced it with a counterfeit. The ramifications are profound, not just for our subjects, but for all of us working on this project. I find myself questioning the morality of our actions, despite the potential benefits our work might bring. Each success brings new fears and new ethical dilemmas. 
With every step forward, the shadows of our actions lengthen, and I fear we are nearing a point of no return. Listen to this, I say, reading out a particularly grim entry. May 17, 1980. Today's experiment centered on Subject 7, a woman in her mid-twenties. Her case has been particularly distressing, her emotional response to the procedure more intense than anticipated. Throughout the process, she exhibited significant signs of emotional distress, crying out repeatedly as we navigated her neural pathways. The procedure at times felt like we were attempting to tune into a television station on an old, faulty set. Her memories flickered in and out, wavering between the reality she knew and the fabrications we were implanting. It was unnerving, seeing her consciousness shifting like this. It felt as though we were tampering with the very essence of her being. Our goal for this session was to implant a fabricated memory of a childhood pet, a dog named Max she never owned. This memory was detailed, filled with crafted narratives of summer afternoons in the park and cozy winter nights with the dog nestled at her feet. Post-procedure, when confronted with the false memory, she recounted it as her own. It was unnerving to watch the ease with which she spoke of Max, her face lighting up with fondness and affection for a creature that never existed. She painted vivid scenes of Max's fur gleaming in the sun, the comforting way of the dog at her feet, the sound of his contented snores, all echoes of a life she had never lived. While the results were promising from a purely scientific perspective, they were deeply disturbing on a human level. We had successfully created a vivid, emotionally charged memory that never happened. But at what cost? The line between reality and fiction is now blurred for Subject 7, and I find myself questioning the ethics of our actions more than ever. The room falls silent, the horror of the account hanging heavily in the air. Kate looks at me, her face pale in the lamplight. Daniel, she murmurs, that's, it's monstrous. A lump forms in my throat. I know, I admit, but I can't stop reading. I turn the page to the next entry. June 6th. 1980. Subject 10's treatment today was the most challenging yet. This individual, a man in his 40s with a stern demeanor, was more resistant to our experimental drugs and techniques than any subject before him. We aimed to not only implant fabricated memories, but also adjust his emotional responses, manipulating his fear response to specific stimuli. The procedure was excruciatingly long, and his distress was pronounced. Despite our attempts to soothe him, his pleas for us to stop echoed in the sterile laboratory throughout the process. However, our mandate is clear, and we must press on regardless of the personal discomfort these pleas cause. Post-procedure, we tested the newly implanted memories and emotional responses. When confronted with a carefully chosen stimuli, Subject 10 reacted not with fear, as was his previous instinct, but with indifference. He also recited the crafted memories as if they were his own. From a clinical perspective, the experiment was a success. From a human perspective, it was devastating to witness. To strip a man of his fear, to alter his emotional response, is to change who he is fundamentally. This entry marks a turning point in our work. We have crossed a line, from manipulation of memory to manipulation of identity. The implications are staggering and terrifying. I find myself unable to pull away. The journals have become an obsession, a puzzle that demands solving. Every free moment I have spent hunched over these books, engrossed in the chilling entries. Danny, are you sure you want to keep going? He asks one evening, concern etched on her face. This, it's starting to scare me. I meet her gaze, a sense of grim determination welling up within me. I have to know, Kate. This is too fascinating. Her lips press into a thin line. Just be careful, okay? This, it's a lot. With a deep breath... I reach for the next journal in the stack, its cover more worn than the rest. My hands tremble slightly as I open the book, the creak of the old spine echoing in my quiet house. The scent of aged paper fills my nostrils, a heady mixture of dust, ink, and time. As the first page reveals itself, the neat handwriting of Dr. Rupert Price greets me. September 1st, 1980. Today, we welcome the new participant into the fold, Subject 23. His name is Peter, a man of roughly 30 years with a kind demeanor and sharp intellect. Peter is a notable addition to the project, mainly because of his strong cognitive abilities and resilience, which we believe will respond positively to our experimental procedures. 
Initial tests indicate that Peter's memory recall and emotional responses are exceptionally strong. His vivid and detailed memories coupled with his emotional depth make him an ideal subject. Peter willingly volunteered for the project after we explained its objective as a treatment for PTSD, unaware of the project's true intention. The ethical implications of this deceit weigh heavy on me, but the mandates from higher up are clear the project must proceed. We plan to start with light manipulations, slightly adjusting memories and observing the effects. Our long-term goal with Peter, however, is to attempt an entirely fabricated memory implantation. This will be a milestone if successful, taking our work to a new level. My hope is that Peter will weather these procedures better than previous subjects. Yet, as I write this, I am not without worry. The prospect of altering such a keen mind brings forth a wave of unease. I remind myself of the potential benefits our work might bring and the lives it could save. But the truth remains that we are stepping into unknown territory with Subject 23. With a heavy heart, I turn the page, bracing myself for what's to come. I feel a chill creeping down my spine as I move on to the next entry. This is where Subject 23's journey takes a dark turn. September 20th, 1980. Our initial optimism with Subject 23 is beginning to wane. The light manipulations we began with Peter have taken an unexpected turn. Instead of the mild disorientation we anticipated, Peter is exhibiting signs of severe cognitive distress. He appears to be struggling with recall, often mixing up basic details about his personal life. His mood has also darkened significantly. The once vibrant individual now seems withdrawn and frightened, often lost in his thoughts. He's reported headaches and sleep disturbances along with fleeting moments where he does not recognize his surroundings nor himself. Most disturbingly, he's begun experiencing hallucinations. These sensory deceptions are not a common side effect of our procedures, suggesting a stronger than expected reaction to the memory manipulations. In today's session, he became agitated, claiming to see shadowy figures lurking in the corners of the room. His pulse spiked, his skin turned a clammy white, and despite our reassurances, he remained visibly shaken for the remainder of the day. I am deeply troubled by these developments. We anticipated side effects, yes, but nothing of this magnitude. We've decided to halt the procedures for now, hoping the distress will abate with time. But I cannot shake the feeling that we have crossed a threshold with Peter that we were not prepared to cross. My stomach churns as I read the disturbing turn of events. A profound sadness washes over me for Peter. Slowly, I turn the page bracing myself for the horrors that could come next and begin to read the next entry. October 15th, 1980. Peter's condition has worsened drastically. Our hope that the cessation of procedures would bring relief to his mental distress has proven futile. He is barely recognizable as a man who first walked into our facility. His memory loss is now so severe that he sometimes forgets his own name. The hallucinations have not only persisted but have become increasingly terrifying for him. He speaks of grotesque figures that lurk in his peripheral vision, of voices whispering words he cannot understand. Despite our best efforts to reassure him, he is consumed by a fear that never seems to leave him. The vibrant, intellectual man we first met has been replaced with a shell of a person, constantly on edge, his eyes reflecting a fear I find deeply unsettling. In today's session, he could barely speak. When he did, it was to beg us to make the vision stop. His pleas were heart-wrenching and it was all I could do to maintain my professional composure. We have consulted with external experts and are making every effort to reverse the damage, but our attempts have so far been unsuccessful. It seems we have ventured too far into the unknown with Peter, with tragic consequences. I cannot help but feel a deep sense of guilt. Peter is a victim of our hubris, and the weight of this realization sits heavily on my conscience. November 25th, 1980 the unthinkable has happened. Peter's condition, far from stabilizing, has taken another devastating turn. His cognitive functions have deteriorated to the point where he struggles to form coherent sentences. His fear has now morphed into a constant state of paranoia, and he frequently becomes hostile toward the staff. Most distressing is the nature of his hallucinations. They have grown in intensity, and he now describes entire scenarios playing out before his eyes. Scenes of violence and horror that are so vivid, he cannot distinguish them from reality. There are moments when he screams out in terror, lost in his own mind, trapped in his own private hell. 
Despite the sedatives and the support of therapy, he is rapidly losing touch with reality. He no longer recognizes me or any of the staff members. Every day I see less of the man he used to be, replaced instead by a terrified, tortured soul. I am no stranger to the harsh realities of our work, but the sight of Peter's suffering is unbearable. What was intended to be a groundbreaking exploration of human cognition has instead turned into a nightmare. The gravity of the situation cannot be understated. We have caused immeasurable harm in our quest for knowledge. Project Broken Minds was supposed to enhance human capability. Instead, it's broken a man. I fear we are watching Peter's descent into madness, a descent that we created. I close my eyes, taking a moment to absorb the weight of what I've just read. The haunting image of Peter's torment sends a shudder through me. With a heavy heart, I turn the page and continue on to the next journal entry. December 10th, 1980. It is with a profound sense of regret that I write this entry. Due to the irreversible and catastrophic deterioration of Peter's mental health, we've made the difficult decision to remove him from the project. He's been officially written off as a tragic casualty of the project. In official documents, he's been referred to as a project setback. The eerie silence from the higher-ups is disconcerting. No acknowledgement of the loss, no condolences, only the cold directive to move forward. It feels wrong and unsettling. I cannot escape the nagging feeling that the circumstances surrounding Peter's death are far from ordinary. His rapid mental degradation, the swift removal from the project, the sudden heart attack, the pieces of the puzzle don't fit neatly. But the unnerving prospect that is beginning to take shape is one that shakes me to my core. I find myself considering a chilling possibility that Peter, Subject 23, was purposefully eliminated. The thought sends a shudder down my spine. But if true, it would mean that those in charge deemed no evidence of this project could be left out in the world, not even the form of a broken man. The truth may never come to light, but I'm writing this down as an admission of our guilt, as an acknowledgement of Peter's suffering. He deserves that much, at the very least. I continue reading, my mind spinning with the shocking revelations. The words of Dr. Price echo through the silence, laden with remorse, guilt, and an overwhelming sense of dread. February 23rd, 1981. I am haunted by the ghost of our missteps, by the faces of those we've wronged. I wake up in the middle of the night, sweating, their screams echoing in my ears. I see Peter in my dreams, his eyes filled with fear and confusion. I can't escape the reality of what we've done. We were meant to advance the human understanding, to push the boundaries of what we knew. But the cost, the cost was too high. We lost ourselves in the process, lost our humanity. And for what? Power? Control. I participated, yes, I allowed it to happen. I have to live with that. But the guilt, the guilt is eating me alive. Reading Dr. Price's words, a strange feeling begins to grow within me. As horrific as his experiments were, as catastrophic as the outcomes, I can't help but feel a sense of sympathy for him. I didn't see it then, the road we were going down. I read out loud from the next entry, dated March 3rd, 1981. The draw of discovery, the promise of revolutionizing our understanding. It blinded me. But now the blinders are off. I see the destruction we'd cause. I see the lives we've ruined. And I'm scared. I'm scared of what we've become. The heaviness of his words hangs in the air. I lean back, letting the journal fall into my lap. I feel a strong connection with Dr. Price, a shared burden. He was trapped by his own hubris. He was a victim too, I realize, a victim of his ambition, of his curiosity, of his own human flaws. And with that realization, my anger towards Dr. Price begins to wane, replaced by a deep-seated sorrow for a man who was swallowed by his own creation. I turn the page to read the final entry in the journals. April 30th, 1981. I find myself at crossroads. The path behind me is littered with the wreckage of lives ruined, the casualties of our hubris. Ahead lies the arduous journey toward redemption, a path I am not sure I am strong enough to tread. As the face of Project Broken Minds, I am responsible for the monstrosities committed. The burden of guilt weighs heavy on my conscience. Each face, each voice, each tear, they haunt me relentlessly. The path toward absolution, if one exists, is not easy. It requires a confrontation of the horrors we've unleashed. But I know now, more than ever, that I need to undertake this journey. 
For the sake of those we've wronged, for the sake of my own sanity, I need to make things right. I'm leaving the project. I can no longer be a part of this, this abomination that we've created. I'll dedicate the remainder of my life to exposing the truths that have been buried and forgotten. Perhaps it won't be enough to atone for our sins, but it's a start. If you're reading this, know that what we did was not out of malice, but out of misguided ambition and a desperate need for validation. We were wrong, I was wrong, and I am sorry. My hope is that the world will learn from our mistakes. The mind is not a playground for the ambitious. It is a sacred sanctuary that should be respected and protected. Let our story serve as a warning, a grim reminder of the consequences of overreaching. I do not know what lies ahead, perhaps redemption, perhaps damnation. But for now, I can only hope that the truth will eventually prevail. The weight of Dr. Price's final words hangs heavy in the air. I sit in stunned silence, the echoes of his guilt and remorse reverberating through my mind. The journal slips from my grasp, thudding softly onto the floor. I lean back against the wall, staring blankly at the aged paper, the potent words of a man lost in his own guilt. A deep, unsettling silence engulfs the room, punctuated only by the distant creaking of the old house settling. My fingers trace over the final lines of the journal over the bold signature of Dr. Rupert Price. A man who began as a faceless villain in a story has become a symbol of a haunting human struggle. I can't shake off a feeling of profound sadness for the man behind these journal entries even though I know I shouldn't. I need to do something about this, I find myself saying aloud with my voice resolute. Dr. Price's story, the tale of Project Broken Minds, can't remain buried in this attic. It's a chilling reminder of the lengths to which man will go in the pursuit of knowledge, a stark warning from the past. Feeling a new sense of determination, I gather the scattered journals. The path ahead won't be easy, but like Dr. Price, I feel a deep-seated need to expose this buried truth. I'm going to bring your story to light, Dr. Price. I whisper into the dusty air of the attic, cradling the worn journals against my chest. You and all the others deserve that much. With that, I descend the attic stairs, the weight of the journals heavy in my arms, but the resolve in my heart even heavier. The task ahead is daunting, but I know it's the right thing to do. For Dr. Price, for Peter, and for everyone affected by Project Broken Minds. I will share their story and make sure the world knows what happened.